Great. Well, top of the hour, let's get rolling. Welcome everyone to our second lecture series of International Dark Sky Week's Night Matters webinars. My name is Chris Peterson. I'll be your moderator and host today. Now, today we'll be really diving into, I would say, insects, the impact of artificial light on insects. Dr. Avalon Owens will speak about the impact of artificial light and what it means for the insect conservation. Dr. Owens will also share why insect conservation is important and how we can help. With that said, I think I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Owens, and we can get started. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Um, wow, okay, I'll just get started. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm just incredibly honored uh, to be speaking at this very exciting Dark Sky Week. I mean, I look forward to it every year, so how cool um, to be here today talking to you all. Um, so my name is Avalon. Um, I run a research group at the Roland Institute at Harvard, where we studied the impact of artificial light on organisms and ecosystems. Um, and the basic idea, my sort of scientific philosophy is light and vision are really at the heart of all life on Earth. Um, light is literally the source of all life on Earth. And most organisms use vision to navigate their environment. They use this light to figure out what's going on in the world. Um, then humans came along and we've started to radically change the nocturnal light environment. And I'm very interested in what that means for the future of life on Earth. Um, in particular, my lab focuses on fireflies and moths, so a bit of an insect focus. And today I'll be talking almost entirely about insects. Um, but I think insects are a good study system for understanding natural systems. And I they can represent, you know, ecosystems as a whole. And also they're really important in themselves. Um, so I'll talk about that as well. Um, let me just get, okay. So um, I bet a lot of you have come to Dark Sky International um, from a stargazer perspective. Um, many of you may be amateur or professional astronomers and really concerned about the disappearance of the stars from the sky, as am I. Um, but I think in recent decades, there's been a growing awareness that we're not, we shouldn't just be concerned about what's going on up there, that light pollution also threatens the things going on all around us on the ground. Um, there was a great article in Scientific American a couple of years ago um, calling for a silent spring moment for light pollution. So just as Rachel Carson wrote about how pesticides were leaking into the environment and, and killing a lot of the things that we rely on um, for the functioning of our ecosystems, light pollution too is leaking into the environment and radically changing natural systems in a way that is very scary and we definitely need to be concerned about. Um, but I'm going to approach this topic today from a slightly different perspective. So I come into this as an insect conservationist. Um, and insect conservationists generally are pretty concerned these days about what's going on with insects. So um, I won't get all into all of the, the details here, but there are a lot of studies coming out showing that insect populations around the world are disappearing. And it seems to be happening pretty quickly and in places where you would think that nothing should be going on. So there's a very famous study out of Germany at a bunch of nature reserves with these completely pristine, beautiful areas where over 30 years, they saw like a 70% decline in, in insect abundance. Um, and that's really very concerning and very hard to explain as well. Um, I promised to tell you all why we should care about insects. So I actually forgot to include that slide, but I'll just say it here. Um, so not only um, are insects sort of valuable within themselves, just like all life forms, they're sort of have inherent worth, right? And should be preserved, but also they're incredibly, incredibly important to our ecosystems. Uh, number one, a lot of insects are out there pollinating our plants, including many of the crops that we farm for food. What is it? One out of every three bites of food that you take is uh, was got there to you with the help of a pollinator of some sort, mostly insects. Um, so not only that, but insects are also important in the food chain in a different way in that um, caterpillars and other insects are a very crucial source of food 
for birds, bats, and other animals that are slightly more charismatic um, and get a little bit more conservation attention. So if you want birds in your backyard, um, your best way of, of ensuring that is to grow your own bird feeder with a pollinator garden that encourages insect activity in your backyard. Um, so insects are super important. They seem to be disappearing. What's going on? Um, that's a bit of a difficult question. And lots of people have spilled lots of ink on the topic. Um, one recent review um, that was pretty influential um, is titled Death by a Thousand Cuts. And it goes through sort of all of the possible culprits behind insect declines. And you can see many of them represented here. Um, so extreme weather events um, due to climate change is a big one, drought, flooding, um, forest fires, et cetera, invasive species, um, in me mechanized agriculture, um, uh, urbanization, air pollution. Uh, a lot of things are shown here, but what's interesting to me, two things. Uh, number one, light pollution does not make an appearance. It is not a focus at all. But even more interesting than that, all of the insects shown here are active during the day. There are no nocturnal insects shown. Um, and this is a thing that I notice a lot. So here's another um, splash image from a paper that came out in 2019 called um, Declines in Insect Abundance and Diversity. We know enough to act now. And so this is their representation of insect abundance and diversity. But I look at this and it seems very one-sided to me. There are very few nocturnal insects shown here. Um, you have a moth up here, a firefly over here, of course. But most of these insects come out during the day. And so, you know, we're more familiar with them because we're more likely to see them, right? It might surprise you to learn that half of all insects are primarily active at night. Um, half of all of the insects out there use natural darkness as their habitat. Um, and these insects are especially threatened by artificial light. It's also generally true um, for most animal groups, it kind of goes up and down, but in general, about half of animals are nocturnal. Um, we just think that there's fewer of them because we don't see them as much, but it's kind of an interesting bias that we have. Um, so we're not talking about nocturnal insects and we're not talking about light pollution as a threat to insects. Um, in defense of the author of this piece, he does go over light pollution um, briefly in the paper. Um, and he says it's maybe a threat to some moths, which I think is a complete understatement. And hopefully I can convince you of that today. Um, but I want to ask a question to guide the first part of this discussion, which is why aren't we talking about light pollution as a threat to insects? Why does it just not come up that often? Um, and there's a couple possibilities um, for why this might be. Uh, maybe light pollution is just not widespread enough. So insect declines seem to be happening all around the globe and light pollution maybe is a little bit more limited to certain areas. Of course, I'm sure many of you know this isn't really true. This is Dark Sky International. We've got a lot of international people here worried about light pollution. Um, but just to prove the point a little bit and to clarify some terms. So I know you guys don't need this introduction, but all the same, um, light pollution is caused by point sources of light on the ground, which um, can bounce up off of reflect reflective surfaces, get up into the sky, and create this sort of diffuse haze known as sky glow, which is the thing um, that astronomers are so upset about because it really reduces star visibility. Um, and sky glow can extend out of centers of urban development for quite a while. It can be detectable many kilometers away from where it originated. Um, and so it has this sort of insidious spread. And we can make uh, models of how light pollution um, is spread around the globe using satellite imagery. And those maps look something like this. So here's the US uh, and all of these different colors represent different levels of light pollution where anything gray and below is a pristine, beautiful night sky. Um, and anything in the red to gray area is truly, truly light polluted like Boston where I'm talking from today. Um, but even these maps of sky glow built from satellite imagery, they really underrepresent the severity of the problem because many sources of light in the environment, like these windows and this beautiful field site where I do research, they might not make it up into the sky to be seen by a satellite. They might not even result in any sky glow. And yet they're still radically altering this habitat, which is shared by fireflies and many other insects. 
So light pollution is hugely widespread. It is a global threat. Um, well, you know, okay, but maybe it's not pervasive. And what I mean by that is maybe it's sort of isolated to these urban areas. Uh, and then we have all of these other sort of rural natural areas where light pollution is not a problem. This is a, a misconception that a lot and a lot of people have. And it's, I would say one of the bigger misconceptions that I deal with daily. Um, and it, it often comes up because people will treat light pollution as a consequence of urbanization. And, and they'll say, even in the um, the image I was showing, let me get it over back here. In this image here, we do have one of these graphics, the one with the little subdiv subdivision over here on the bottom on the bottom left, where this is supposed to represent urbanization or human development. And people will say light pollution is an outcome of human development. Um, and it is, but it's not just that. So um, this is an image of one of the nature reserves in Germany, where those researchers I mentioned found these dramatic declines in insect abundance. And you can actually see um, they've put in an image of one of their insect traps right there, which is how they did their surveying. And looking at this, you might think, wow, it's so beautiful. It's so green. It's so natural. There's no roads. There's no houses. This is some pristine habitat, right? I mean, there's a little bit of agriculture going on over here, but still beautifully pristine. However, if you look at a map of the sites where all of these um, areas were surveyed, most of them are highly concentrated in these light polluted urban areas, not right in the middle of the city, but they're still getting a lot of sky glow from the development nearby. So areas on the border of cities can be very light polluted because of cities. Not only that, but places in the middle of nowhere, as shown by this map, um, can have a lot of light pollution from other human structures, such as oil and gas drilling operations, or things like the US-Mexico border wall, which is lit up to an extreme extent, despite the fact that there aren't really people living here on the wall, right? Um, and, uh, uh, even if you discount all, if you could count all these places as urbanized or developed to some extent, um, maybe there's still some pristine dark areas where light pollution doesn't reach, right? Um, but even that I find, you know, extremely rare. So this is um, a night sky image, a false color image of the night sky around Chaco Culture National Historical Park, which is an international dark sky park where they put a lot of effort into keeping the night sky as beautiful, pristine and dark um, as it was when the ancestral Pueblo peoples were looking at it way back when. Um, and so you can see the Milky Way, it's very beautiful. Um, but even here in this isolated dark sky park, the night sky is not natural. If you subtract out light from the Milky Way and other natural sources of light, oh, there's the Milky Way, you can still clearly see the glow of nearby cities on the horizon. And it's not just us who can see this. All of the animals living there can see this and it can change their behavior in very damaging ways. So I would argue that light pollution is hugely pervasive. And just speaking from personal experience, um, for my research, I go to dark places to do science, right? Um, but none of the field sites that I work at, even though they're sort of the centers of insect diversity, places where you can find a lot of fireflies, for example, none of them are completely dark. All of them have light sources um, from buildings nearby or in the distance. Um, and I think many of us would be hard pressed to find a truly, truly dark, naturally dark site in the year 2024. Um, Speaking of the year, um, some people might argue that light pollution, like the timing is wrong. So insect declines uh, seem to be, have started in the mid 20th century and sort of are accelerating over time. Um, and so the timeline for light pollution um, may not quite make sense. Is light pollution really accelerating the same way that insect declines are accelerating? And of course the answer is yes. Um, so just as, um, a sort of fun example, this is a painting of Boston Common at twilight that was painted in the late 1900s. And you can see um, the artist's depiction of public lighting is very, very simple. So you have these lamps, probably um, gas lamps, um, sort of intermittently around the border of the park. And otherwise, um, there's not all that much lighting going on, right? Um, 
compare that to today, this is what Boston Common at twilight looks like. Um, so a truly, truly enormous expansion in the number of lights um, in the area to the point that it's, I mean, everything is lit up, truly everything. Um, and you might say, well, that's not fair because Boston Common is the middle of a city. Um, and fair enough. However, I think this is symptomatic of the larger trend, which is as lighting technology has become more and more inexpensive, we have started to put lights everywhere. Um, so here's a very infuriating article from the New York Times. I don't know if any of you saw this uh, about outdoor landscape lighting. Um, and the whole idea is that um, it's, you know, it's very important to be conscious in the way that you light your space, which on the surface sounds great, right? Um, but they have a lot of sort of implicit um, uh, beliefs put forth in this article such that you should light up your your yard because it creates this aesthetic experience, not only um, for you outside in your yard at night, but even when you're indoors in your house, sometimes it's kind of ugly to see the reflection of your, your indoor lamps uh, from the window. And so if you light up your outside yard, you, it'll break the reflection a little bit and you can have a more aesthetic experience. And I just think that's the silliest possible reason um, to light up a green space. And yet, you know, people will put lights for far sillier reasons. Um, and in particular, the things that really grind my years that seem to have become really popular uh, in recent, in like the last 10 years, are um, tree lights that just light up a tree from the bottom up. And then under bridge lights, we have one and a bridge right by my office. The lights under the bridge that shine right into the river. Nobody needs to walk safely in the river. All they're doing is disturbing the fishes. Um, I'm sure I, I'm sure you all sympathize, so I won't go on, uh, but I will just say all of this adds up, right? And so we have, uh, again, more models of light pollution um, spread over time, and it shows that there is this dramatic growth over the past century. And in fact, this paper was published in 2001. Their projection for 2025 is, I mean, I think we're already way past it with LED lighting. Um, so things are accelerating really, really rapidly. Um, to a certain extent, we don't even realize how rapidly it's happening because we rely on satellite data that have a lot of flaws. Um, so many of you may know that LEDs tend to be very rich in blue wavelengths. It just so happens that satellite images cannot pick up blue wavelengths. And so you often see things like this, where this is the city of Milan before an LED streetlight transition, and this is the city after. And according to the satellite, it got darker, but the people on the ground who can see the blue light um, could tell you that it actually became brighter on the ground. Um, so a recent study, which I'm sure many of you may have seen, um, used citizen science counts of star visibility, so people on the ground looking up uh, instead of satellites looking down. And they found that we had totally underestimated how quickly light pollution is growing, that we used to think it was it got um, half as bright in 25, the sky became tw half as bright in 25 years, and now it is the sky became twice as bright in 10 years. Um, just really, really crazy numbers. Anyway, um, so light pollution is definitely a recent threat and one that is intensifying rapidly as insect populations decline rapidly. Um, so the last possibility, and I think the one that many people cling to, um, to justify their lack of attention to this problem, is that maybe it's just not a big deal, you know? Uh, maybe light pollution isn't that bad for insects, and we should be way more concerned about other things like climate change and pesticide use. And I'm not here to compare these things or declare one of them like the threat to insects, because I think it's true that a lot of things are impacting insects. Um, but I don't agree that light pollution is not a big deal. I don't think any of the evidence supports this. And I'm going to go through some of the evidence uh, in a bit. But first, I want to argue from first principles that we should really care about light pollution as a threat to insects. So... <laughs> For think of if you think back to the origin of life on Earth, you know millions and millions and millions of years ago, um, things were dark at night and light during the day, and this cycle of light and dark shaped some of the most like ancestrally conserved um, behaviors 
in living organisms, which is cycles of activity, um, doing things when it's light and not when it's dark or vice versa. And it, it stayed light during the day and dark at night for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, within the past couple hundred years, we've radically changed um, this evolutionary um, balance of light and darkness. And so insects and other animals have no ability to sort of cope with this totally novel stress. And if you compare that to things like climate change, the climate has warmed before, and we have had extreme weather events before, not to the extent that we're having them now, but still there's some ability of animals to adapt to changing climate. And in fact, we're watching many of them do this. So insects move north um, to escape the heat and move higher in altitude um, for the same reason. So they have these behaviors that they're able to use to try to cope with this environmental change. Um, pesticide use is another threat to insects, but pesticides, many of them are based off of plant defenses, things that plants do to deter insects from eating them, right? And so plant defenses have been around for about as long as insects have been eating plants. And so insects have evolved ways to adapt and to evolve resistance to pesticides and other things, um, as well as plant defenses. So the sort of evolutionary machinery is there, but for light pollution, there is no evolutionary analog. And so insects and other animals end up doing some pretty weird things just because they're not really able to cope with this novel stressor. Um, so I wrote a paper a while ago now, sort of reviewing the various um, impacts of artificial light on insects. And we're gonna go through the highlights here today. Um, but this um, graphic is just to represent um, you know, ecological networks are beautifully entwined in these complex ways. And if you you touch one part of the network, many other things are affected, right? Um, and this is very true of insects and their ecosystems. And light pollution is the way that we disturb the network and cause a bunch of um, downstream effects. So um, what are the ways that light pollution affects insects? I think the big one has to do with time. Um, insects' perception of time. And insects can tell time just like we can. Um, they have internal clocks that they use to time certain activities. So for example, here's a moth um, and it's pollinating this beautiful flower. And it's not gonna come out in the middle of the day to pollinate that flower, right? It just hasn't evolved that way. So instead it waits until it gets dark and it comes out and it engages in its foraging activity. Um, so Almost all insects have patterns of activity like this where, where, where they will do certain things at certain times. Now imagine this moth waits until it gets dark to start foraging. If it never gets dark, it might wait forever and end up missing out on opportunities to find food, to attract mates, to lay eggs, all of these important behaviors that are timed to certain areas uh, of the day and night. And in fact, we use this fact in pest control. So um, in some places, it's pretty common to put lights in greenhouses. I mean, there's many reasons to put lights in greenhouses, but one thing that lights can do is deter um, nocturnal insects, especially caterpillars, from chewing the leaves of whatever it is you're growing. So by making it bright all the time, there's no night and if feeding activity occurs during the night, you can just turn that off by turning on the lights. Um, so concerningly, we are turning on the lights in a lot of places, um, and it could have this very big impact on the timing of behaviors. Um, so this is um, what I'm talking about here are daily rhythms of behavior, but just as um, it gets light during the day and dark at night, it's also lighter during the summer and darker during the winter. And so these daily things kind of turn into yearly patterns as well. And insects are highly attuned to yearly patterns of light and darkness. Um, and I'll highlight two examples here. So um, on the left, these are aphids. Um, fun fact of the day is that during the summer, a lot of aphids will clone themselves rather than engaging in sexual reproduction. They'll just produce daughter aphids. They give live birth. It's absolutely wild. They're just cloning themselves. And they do this to reproduce quickly so that they can take advantage of plants that are in the environment that they can feed on. Um, and when it comes time for winter, um, they'll shift into another mode. And so they'll start engaging in sexual reproduction and they'll produce um, these this form, 
this uh, aphid form that's more robust and able to survive the winter. Um, on the right here, this is an image of leaf mining moth caterpillars. So you can see one here uh, and one down here. And these are caterpillars that live inside leaves. And um, similar to aphids during the summer, they, in, they have a very fast life cycle. They make a lot of generation so that they can take advantage of the sunlight and the leaves when they have them available. Um, when it gets closer to winter and the leaves start dying and the trees start preparing for the winter, these leaf mining caterpillars will do the same thing. So they'll shift into a winter stage that's a little bit hardier um, and can essentially hibernate until next spring when it becomes active again and engages in its summertime activities. So many, many insects have a summer mode and a winter mode. What matters for our purposes is that the insects time the transition from summer to winter, not using temperature, but often by using light. Um, so they'll look for days to get shorter. And when days get shorter, they're like, okay, winter is coming soon. I should probably prepare. As you know, light pollution interferes with this cycle and can prevent insects from detecting the days are getting shorter. And in both of these studies that I've cited here, the authors found that what you would predict would happen was happening. So the aphids were staying in their summer mode um, and reproducing quickly. These leaf mining moths were staying in their summer mode and just chewing away. Meanwhile, in both of these studies, it's getting colder and colder and colder. And these insects are totally unprepared for what's to come. Um, so by interfering with an insect's sense of time of year, um, light pollution can also have a huge impact. And uh, just one more uh, little soapbox moment here, um, aphids and leaf mining moths, neither of these are nocturnal. <laughs> so these are insects that are active during the day and light pollution is still having a big impact on their ability to be insects successfully. Um, so even though nocturnal insects are probably more threatened by light pollution, I would argue that all insects are threatened by light pollution. Um, and that is a really good reason to care. Um, so moving on, light pollution also, as you know, it erases the stars and it sort of obscures the night sky. Um, many insects actually rely on the night sky to navigate their environment. Um, so for example, these are dung beetles um, that um, they uh, approach dung in the wild and they'll roll it into these little balls. And then their job is to roll the ball away from the dung as soon as possible so that nobody else gets it. And then they go and they bury it and they lay their eggs in it. And so they have to roll their ball in a straight line. That is their job. Um, and the way they do this is they literally um, get up on top of it, look up at the stars and follow the line of the Milky Way or use the Milky Way as a cue um, in order to keep a straight trajectory. Um, however, light pollution obscures the Milky Way and it obscures patterns of moonlight and other light, light cues in the night sky that insects would use to navigate. And so studies have shown that light pollution leads to this disorientation behavior where the dung beetle will sort of slowly move in a random path like, like any of us were um, had our eyes closed and tried to walk in a straight line. It doesn't work. Um, and that has impacts on their ability to raise young, right? Um, and these impacts of light pollution on insect navigation sort of culminate in this very weird thing. And maybe the first thing that you think of when I say light pollution in insects, which is what we call flight to light behavior, this phenomenon where many insects will circle artificial light sources or perch nearby them um, and spend an entire evening doing this instead of, you know, <laughs> foraging, finding mates, laying eggs, or doing the important insect behaviors that they need to survive. Um, and so this happens nightly. If you go out during the summer and look at light sources, you're bound to see some insects nearby. Um, and all sorts of insects are attracted to light in this way. Sometimes it can be truly absurd. So this is an image of mayflies attracted to the lights over a bridge. Um, and these mayflies are not supposed to be um, near these lights or on this bridge, they're actually supposed to be in the water beneath the bridge, but the light attracts them and distracts them from their normal insect activities. Um, and many insects are also eaten by predators while doing this, but even the ones that aren't still, again, aren't doing their normal insect things. Um, 
Uh, another way, so for each insect that is attracted to a light, there is another insect that is repelled by light. And we don't really talk about this as much because it's much harder to study. Um, but there is an example out of New Zealand where these very charismatic cave weta, which is a type of cricket, um, they live in caves and they will only emerge when it's dark enough for them to go hunt around in their environment for food. Uh, keyword dark enough, right? So if you put lights near the cave entrance, these insects won't emerge and they will skip entire evenings of finding food, finding mates, et cetera. The same, the same um, idea. I should also mention, you know, I'm talking about missing an entire evening and to us that seems like maybe not a huge deal, but it's important to remember that most insects live for like a week a couple weeks. And for them, one or two evenings could be a large percentage of their life that they're not doing their normal insect things. Um, also fun fact, or not so fun fact, um, this is a great paper um, by this photographer who noted that many insects, um, katydids, crickets, and grasshoppers will actually shield their eyes from a camera flash. So it's almost as if their eyes are so sensitive that the light of a camera um, causes them pain or some sort of disturbance and they'll shield their eyes from it. Um, and I use this to um, suggest the idea, many nocturnal insects have very sensitive eyes and we don't really know how bad light pollution is for them because not very many people are asking the crickets like how well they see after a night of light pollution. But I think it's a really important um, area that needs more research. And then the final thing I want to talk about, the final way that light pollution affects insects is it changes the way that things look. So for example, on the left here, we have a foxglove flower as it is as it looks in daylight. Beautiful pink. Uh, right next to it here, this is what the flower looks like to a moth at night. This is, um, uh, so the moths that pollinate this flower are capable of full color vision at night. Um, even when it's super, super dark, it's actually extremely impressive. And they're looking for flowers that look like this. Um, when this flower is lit up by a cool white LED, it looks like this. And when the flower is lit up by an amber LED, it looks like this. And we can look at these images and be like, okay, this is the same flower under different lighting. Um, but humans are actually particularly good at this visual discrimination task. Um, insects are not so smart. And so for them, they look at this orange thing and they're like, whoa, 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 you know, that's not for me. Uh, my flowers all look dark and blue. And so um, light of unusual color can obscure things in the environment and make it difficult for animals to recognize host plants, prey, predators, and other of their species. And nowhere is this more pronounced or more, I think, alarming to us than for fireflies. So fireflies are very charismatic beetles that use light emitted from their lanterns to attract mates. Um, every string of lights in this uh, long exposure photograph are signals produced by a flying male firefly who releases a chain of light as an advertisement to ladies on the ground. Um, and when females on the ground see uh, a signal that they like, they'll flash back and the two will engage in what's called a courtship dialogue. And so in the lab, I worked with pairs of male and female fireflies and observed their courtship under controlled conditions. So I'll show you a video here. So on the top is a male firefly. That's his little advertisement. And the female's right down here. She flashes back. He flashes, she flashes back, he flashes again, and she flashes back. Now I'm gonna turn on an overhead light and you can see the male keeps flashing there in the middle, flash, 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 but the female on the ground goes almost completely dark. He keeps trying, um, but just doesn't get a response. Um, and uh, we tested this with a whole bunch of colors and in darkness. And we found that male fireflies flashed quite a bit when it was dark, about 10 times a minute. And the female fireflies below would answer the males almost every time. So this is a very successful dialogue. He says, hey, how it's going? How's it going? She says, great, how are you? And um, the two could find each other and mate, right? Um, under five colors and two intensities of artificial light, males started flashing a lot less. And this is what we see in the field at um, 
in firefly habitats that are really highly lit, there's just a little bit less flash activity. There's not as much going on. Um, and this was true regardless of whether it was a cool white or a warm white LED, a blue LED, an amber LED, or a red LED. Um, so the males are flashing about half as much, but what's really scary <laughs> is that the females went almost completely dark to the point that under a bright amber light, no female ever flashed once. Um, and I think this is likely because the females are looking up and it's just very hard for them to see the males against the light pollution. Or maybe they can see them, but they just don't look as nice because their flashes don't look as bright. And so by changing the background lighting in the habitat, artificial light can impair firefly courtship which then impairs firefly reproduction um, and prevents us from having fireflies into the future. Um, and rather than dwell on that sad thought, um, let's return to um, our four reasons why we might not be talking about light pollution. Um, so I think hopefully I've shown today that light pollution is a pretty big deal for insects. There's many, many ways in which it affects insect behavior. And these effects have consequences um, for insects' ability to reproduce and make more insects and continue to pollinate our plants and feed our birds um, and light up our night as with the firefly. And so I don't think any of these are good reasons to um, ignore light pollution as a threat to insects. I think the big reason that nobody talks about it um, is very simply that most people don't see it. And especially scientists. I think scientists are very blind to light pollution as an ecological threat. Um, and if there's one thing I do in this life, I hope it is to convince scientists to take this seriously. But in their defense, um, light pollution is usually pretty hard to see. So most um, entomologists, ecologists, conservation scientists, they spend a lot of time in places like this. This is actually uh, a nature reserve by my house. Um, and look how beautiful, right? It's gorgeous. It's green. It's got all these, uh, look, there's some geese, you know, there's lots of insects here uh, and the gorgeous plants and, you know, talk about humans and nature living together in beautiful harmony, right? Um, and so you could imagine a research scientist could do a bunch of exciting field work here during the day, um, testing all sorts of things, looking at insects, etc., and just think that they're having a great time. Uh, little do they know if they leave, uh, if they were to not leave, they were to stay there at night, this very same place at night is completely disrupted. Um, and night is about half of the time, right? So half of the time, all of the animals in this area are experiencing intense amounts of light pollution that most people simply don't see because at night they go home and to bed, they close their curtains and it's like not their problem. Um, so... I know all of you uh, probably see light pollution more than you would uh, <laughs> wish to, um, but most people are not like you. Most people uh, have no idea that this is even a thing that we should be worried about. Um, with my final five or so minutes, I wanna talk a little bit about the um, Dark Sky International five principles of responsible outdoor lighting. Um, Cause I think these are really interesting. Um, so I'm sure you all know them very well. And this is ideas that um, lights are not great and we can make them better by shielding them so that light is only directed where it's needed, um, changing the color of the light to warmer wavelengths that are less, um, cause less sky glow and are less harmful if we talk about blue rich light, um, et cetera. Um, dimming the lights as dim as possible and putting them on timers or motion detectors so that they're not on when no one is around. So, um, these guidelines, I mean, <laughs> were probably uh, made by people with a bit of an astronomical focus. Um, the Dark Sky International has had an astronomical focus for a long time. And like you guys do great work. You guys, us guys, I'm a member of the Massachusetts chapter. So I think we do great work talking about the ecosystem as well. Um, but you can't deny there's a bit of a history of um, uh, a bit of an astronomical focus. And so I think it's really interesting to consider how these guidelines um, what they may or may not do for insects. So for example, shielding. Um, shielding can dramatically reduce the amount of light uh, visible from space. And the flip side of that is it can dramatically reduce sky glow and increase star visibility. However, does it really uh, decrease insect flight to light behavior? Um, I often see insects flying to lights that are perfectly well shielded. A lot of insects are on the ground and they get sort of pulled upwards by light. 
So the degree to which shielding um, reduces that particular impact of uh, lighting, I think is undetermined. There aren't really great studies on this, but my intuition is it probably helps a little bit, but not as much as you might think. Um, the things that we're concerned about are on the ground. And so pointing the light at the ground um, it won't really help all that much now. I should say good shielding also focuses the light on walkways and not like yards and bushes and trees. Um, and of course that will be extremely helpful. Um, so changing color. So we often recommend amber, um, amber lights, uh, warm white lights as less disruptive uh, to animals or and to the sky and to animals and to humans. Um, and to some extent, this is true. Um, so these, uh, this is a graph of the colors of light that different animals see. Um, the dotted line are vertebrates, so birds, lizards, humans, et cetera. This is an average. So on average, um, vertebrates are really, really good at seeing green um, and not so good at seeing orange and red. The black line here is invertebrates, primarily insects, and you see a bit of a shift where insects are actually really good at seeing UV light, which we can't even see at all. Um, pretty good at seeing green, not so good at seeing red. But importantly, you know, there is some overlap here where a lot of animals out there in the ecosystem can see amber light. And it would be it would be great if we could find a color of light that only humans could see, but humans, of course, are animals. And so uh, unfortunately, there's just a lot of um, overlap there in the different colors um, that animals can see. I will say most insects are very, very bad at seeing red. Um, and kind of a bit worse at seeing amber or orange. Um, but concerningly, fireflies are really disturbed by amber light in particular. Uh, if we go back this image here, more than blue or red um, because of the overlap of amber with the color of the firefly flash itself, which is usually yellow or green. So um, certain insects are highly disrupted by amber. And um, as a firefly lover myself, I always recommend red light wherever possible. Um, okay, what about dimming? Keeping lights as dim as possible should be hugely beneficial to animals in the environment, right? You would think so. <laughs> um, but one thing that's worth considering is that um, things are dim. We, we judge things as dim or bright using our sort of human view of the world. And humans are very, very bad at seeing at night, our night vision. I mean, um, most of us don't even experience our full night vision. And uh, if any of you have ever um, probably have right gone out into very dark areas and let your eyes fully adapt you'll be shocked by how much you can see that is true but you would also be shocked by how much other animals can see way more than you um so insects are uh, sorry humans we we are actually relatively speaking not that good at seeing in the dark um Insects, especially nocturnal insects, tend to be extremely good at seeing in the dark. So I told you there are some kinds of moths that are capable of full color vision at night. They can see the color of flowers and they can use that to judge where to go. Um, we only have black and white vision at night when fully light adapted. And they also tend to have huge eyes that are just designed to absorb as many photons as possible. Um, and not only that, but just like us, their eyes can light adapt or dark adapt. And when fully dark adapted, they can be just insanely sensitive. And so us dimming a light might make us feel good and it'll look a lot darker to us. And there's lots of benefits in just cutting down the total number of photons in the environment. Um, but I think a lot of insects have very sensitive eyes and even a, a very, very dim light can be quite impactful. Um, the final thing I wanna talk about are timers. Um, so we often talk about this as a good solution. So an automatic timer would turn out the lights maybe around 11 p.m. or midnight so that lights aren't on you know, in the early morning when nobody's around. Um, this is a graph of insect activity over the course of the year and over the course of the day, um, where the redder the, the little block, the more insect activity there is. And you'll notice that there's a lot of insect activity concentrated right around this pink line in the morning and in the evening. And this pink line is showing the time of sunset. So this is some of the first data on insect activity, just free flying insects in the environment. And it shows that a lot of what we consider 
to be nocturnal insects are mostly active at dusk. And this sort of tracks with my own impression of nocturnal insects. Um, so you get a lot and a lot of insect activity at dusk um, and less so into the middle, middle of the night and early hours, although there is still some. What does this mean for us? It means when we're out on the streets at night, you know, doing our late night, you know, visiting restaurants or whatever, the insects are out too. And so turning out the lights at midnight probably helps, but it doesn't help as much as you might think, unfortunately. These are just my sort of subjective impressions. Uh, I think for a lot of these things, we, we do need more research. And it's one of the areas that I'm interested in exploring in the future is how exactly the five principles align with um, insect conservation. Um, I'm not the only person to be thinking about this. Um, some of you may have heard this, this is a um, bat reserve in the Netherlands where um, the subdivision near a bat reserve has installed these very environmentally friendly um, red lights that are meant to not disturb the bats as much as possible. And so you can see they're fully shielded, they're really dim, they're super red, they're pointed only at the path. Um, and we can use this as a model of like truly ecologically friendly lighting, except that the number one principle is being violated here. These lights are on and there's nobody around. And so um, from my perspective, turning out lights or putting lights on motion detectors is always going to be the best way of eliminating their impact on insects and other animals. Conveniently, insects can't trigger motion detectors. Um, and so they're a pretty great solution as far as I'm concerned. Um, so just to wrap it up, uh, with this extremely well illuminated stock image of people stargazing. I really like this. There's like so much light pollution. <laughs> um, so uh, I think insect conservation and dark sky conservation have a lot in common. Um, and I'm going to take some uh, in an image from a talk that um, a very famous entomologist Dan Jansen gave at the Entomological Society of America meeting in, I want to say, 2019. Um, where he was trying to figure out what are the causes of insect decline. And he brought it back to the real issues, which is public apathy, public fear, public ignorance, and science ignorance. So people don't care about insects. People are afraid of insects. People don't know uh, about insects and how they're doing. And scientists have no idea how insects are doing because we totally lack data. I think the exact same thing is true of dark sky conservation. So why are we struggling with light pollution so much? People don't care about light pollution as an issue. People are afraid of the dark and they want to light it up with lights. People are ignorant. This is even a problem because they go home at night, close their curtains and just totally shut it out. And scientists are ignorant that this is a problem because they go out into their field sites during the day. Everything looks green and beautiful. They go home and have no idea what's going on at night. Um, so all of these things are addressable with outreach, and that's what Dark Sky International is so great at. And um, that's what I'm trying to do here today is spread the message a little bit um, about how we should think about these issues and, and what we can do going forward. Um, so with that, um, there's many people um, to thank, including uh, Dark Sky International. I'm just a huge fan as well as a member of the Massachusetts chapter, but I just think um, you guys do amazing work. Um, and um, and there's many other people out there doing amazing work. Um, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation has really been getting into firefly conservation and dark sky outreach as a result. There's some really cool overlaps there. I'm really excited to see it. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Avalon. That was such a fantastic presentation. And there is just nothing but admiration and thanks to you in the chat going on. Just this whole meeting, blowing Aww. mind, making us educated. Just wonderful. So thanks a Aww. lot for that. Thank you. Yeah. And we will move into the uh, Q&A portion of our uh, chat today, folks. If right before I do get into that uh, I will make the plug for International Dark Sky Week if you want to check out tomorrow's presentation with uh, Ravis Henry talking about uh, really the cultural heritage of the Navajo Nation and how it relates to the dark sky and perhaps the eclipse we'll be talking about that at the same time tomorrow and make sure you take the dark sky pledge or get connected for proclamation season 2025 so the first question I'll ask to you, Dr. Owens, 
Um, are there different steps or practices we can take in our yards or places, businesses, otherwise, to help insects at night versus those during the day? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, I'll talk about insects generally and then fireflies specifically. Um, so um, in general, I think um, you have a huge impact um, on the life in your yard and more and more as things become more developed, yards become these real like refuges of a lot of natural diversity and insect diversity. Um, and so I would say uh, keeping your yard dark is number one. So um, reducing the number of security lights in your house, the path lights, certainly tree lights. I mean, many insects live in trees and so lighting up the tree maybe not the best thing to do. And that that lighting is purely aesthetic, right? And that's the thing that we recommend removing as <laughs> first is the lights that don't serve a purpose. Um, so reducing the use of lights. And also um, I always recommend planting really like leafy things, bushes, trees, um, shade trees that can sort of block out light maybe from your neighbors or the surrounding neighborhood. Um, in general as well, um, a nice pollinator garden is going to help both nocturnal and day active insects quite a lot. So we're talking about native plants, flowering plants. Um, they can really just increase the diversity in your yard quite a bit. In general, um, moths um, prefer a really fragrant white flowers. And if you're interested in this kind of a thing, you should Google moon gardens, which are gardens planted for nocturnal insects instead of um, day active insects that involve really beautiful white flowers um, and things that are that open during the night instead of during the day. And then for fireflies, all of the same applies. Um, we also really recommend leaving leaf litter on the ground. A lot of insects live in leaf litter um, and firefly larvae do as well. And then not using pesticides as much as possible. Um, I think it's sort of self-explanatory. Um, if you're trying, for example, to kill um, turf pests, like the root boring beetles in your soil that eat your grass, um, fireflies are also beetles in your soil. They don't eat your grass, but they do live there um, and pesticides will affect them the same way. Very interesting. The next question, and folks feel free to submit it. Even if we don't get to it, we will be able to provide written response or forward it to Dr. Owens after the presentation. Um, the next one is kind of a three-parter. Um, so I think we talked a little bit about why nocturnal insects like moths are attracted to lights. Is it true that certain colors of light, certain insects cannot see? And then now there's a question, so amber light is the worst for fireflies? Could you talk maybe a bit more about that? Gladly. Um, yeah, I think that one's a really, uh, nobody likes to hear that. Um, so insect vision, it's kind of, um, it's really diverse. It's more diverse um, than most animal groups because insects are a super diverse group. In general, um, insects see shorter wavelengths better. So they see UV light really, really well, blue light and then green light, and then they're less good at seeing yellow, less good at seeing amber, and really not very good at seeing red. That's generally true. Um, there's no reason to have UV light out in the environment because we can't see it. So hopefully that one's easy to avoid. But we also recommend avoiding blue light, which uh, overlaps with the recommendations uh, for other reasons, sky glow and human health. That all like uh, overlaps quite nicely. Um, we often recommend amber lighting as this sort of compromise solution where um, it doesn't seem to have as big of an impact on sleep and human health and sky glow but it's not red light because people don't want red light. It's kind of spooky um, and it's less easy to um, see color and to see motion. And so we have these concerns about safety. So amber light seems like a good solution. And I think in general um, it is, and it is relatively less disruptive to most insects. It just so happens that fireflies are pretty good at seeing yellow, um, sort of green, yellow, and amber, because firefly flashes are green, yellow, and amber. And they're really, really keyed into these colors. And so amber light, I've done a couple experiments looking at this, and every time amber comes out as the most disruptive light color by far, more so than even cool white or warm light light, because I really think the fireflies just cannot distinguish between another firefly and an amber light. I think to many of them, 
uh, an amber light looks like the most beautiful firefly they've ever seen. And that is not good if we want them to find mates. So in firefly habitat specifically, I think we need to be a little bit more careful and really go towards dim red lights and really minimizing light generally as much as possible. In many places, people are there to see fireflies, right? And you can't see them very well if there's lights on anyway. So you might as well keep it really, really dim, really dark and very red shifted. Wonderful. Thank you. That's a great response. Um, that, such an easy question, but I love it. If you had to give us your elevator pitch, just a quick sentence in your words, why should people care about insects in general? <laughs> um, <laughs> ah, insects are most things. <laughs> like in terms of species, most things are insects. So most um, diversity on earth is insects. Um, and also the foundations of our food system are insects. Insects pollinate our plants and they're also food for other animals. Without insects, we just wouldn't be here. Wonderful. Thank you. I know you're giving our followers, advocates, lots of tidbits and snippets to use in their own advocacy. Now, I wanted to, I think we'll have time for one or two more questions, but I wanted to share a quick snippet from uh, actually Nightscape editor Megan Eves provided just a great uh, sentence or two in the chat. And I just wanted to share that with everyone, make sure they could hear it. There's no silver bullet for light pollution and not, no one single approach that can fix the problem everywhere. It's important for advocates and communities to understand their local environments and implement the right solutions for their local area. For example, if you have a lot of fireflies, you may need a different approach the non-firefly areas, and so on. So again, that was a just a quick snippet from Megan Eves, our Nightscape editor, and just a fantastic um, statement. And I see, is it Marsha? You have had your hand up. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Did you have a question for Dr. Owens? I did. I, I didn't realize you were taking the questions through the thing. No, so please. I. Go ahead. It was actually, I found it really interesting. Thank you so much for all the info. I've got my moon garden. I've got my leaf litter. I've got all the things, the pollinator block. Um, but I did not know about how some insects are drawn. I mean, I know moths are drawn to light, but some are repelled by. And I was wondering if the angle of uh, approaching gardeners that are still very pesticide happy, bright lights, all the things, the angle of utilizing the dark to repel pests like you said that I think you said that bright lights will cause aphids to be more vigorous and people are always about aphids in the spring. Oh, I mean, every garden thing I'm on. And I thought that's really interesting because I don't have a big issue with that. And I wonder if it's because my yard is so dark comparatively. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that's an angle you can use to say, hey, if you darken your lights, you won't have as many aphids. I'm well, I think, no, I think you, you, this is a really good, and thanks for bringing it up, because I think that's, it's definitely an angle. Um, and for everybody, like, I'm on the side, like, get more insects in your yard, like, it's going to be great, like, the buggier, the better. And I, I think you can appeal to bird watchers, because truly, like, birds love insects, um, and birds will love having insects in your yard. Um, but also, People don't like insects, right? And I think um, the number one sort of hook that I would use is mosquitoes. It's not just moths that are attracted to light. Mosquitoes are hugely attracted to light. And there's actually a lot of interest now in the scientific community in looking at how lights affect disease spread because lights are near human settlements. Um, all these mosquitoes come in near where the humans are. Um, and they, you know, you know what happens next. So I think um, using mosquitoes and other... Uh, light attracted animals that are not so great um, can be a good way. Gnats as well, biting flies, you know, there's a lot of things that, and, and if you stand near a light at night, like sometimes we go out, if we turn on a white headlamp, you get things like pelting your face. Um, you know, you might want to avoid that. Yeah, I would love some literature somewhere that I could share because people are going to say that's not true. They like shade. And so I would love to be able to count. It would be that. great to make like a little brochure. I mean, we don't, it's still kind of like, there's a very, very few studies on this. We're sort of at its infancy, but the whole mosquito light human health angle, I think it would be cool to put together some info on that. Hmm. That'd be really cool. Thanks, Marsha. Thanks, Avalon. And in the chat right now, the buggier, the better. Love it. Great, great quote to whoever wrote that. I think we'll just go with one more. And um, thanks again, Dr. Owens, for your time with us today. 
And again, folks, if you want to learn more about Dark Sky, visit darksky.org or get the rest of our week's events at idsw.darksky.org. This video will be available on YouTube following our live event, and we'll make sure you all get a link as well. Now, I think the last question we'll go to today is how do folks at home contribute either to the studies or a database of insects affected by light? Is there a way people can do this work from home and support work like yours? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> so um, I think the the best and probably the most fun way to get involved as well is through the firefly angle. And I think fireflies are really good flagship species for dark sky conservation because people love them. Um, and, and they're, yeah, because people love them. Um, so there are a couple of firefly programs out there, and I think the best one is being run by the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. That's X-E-R-C-E-S, Xerces Society. They do a lot of really great work, but they have a firefly program. It's called Firefly Atlas, where they're working on training volunteers to identify fireflies and then sending them out into areas where um, we just don't know what's going on. And there seem to be a lot of fireflies at risk from things like light pollution, and other things. And so these volunteers can go out and just hunt for the fireflies, count them and figure out who's where, because um, as far as firefly conservation goes, we're still kind of at that stage where we're not really sure um, how many are out there or how they're doing. Um, for other insects, I think in general, if you wanna get involved watching insects, you can always download iNaturalist, which is a really cool community science app where you can take photos of insects and other animals, other life forms, and submit them to the app. And then it will help you identify them. And that data gets sent to a giant database where people can access it and look to see how insects are doing over time. So Xerces Society and iNaturalist, I think, are the best places to start. Wonderful. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks again, Dr. Owens, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, it, th this, I, I don't know if I learned so much in an hour before today, so this was just amazing. Best to you all, and take care. Thank, Thank you. you.